Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen moderators and Brother Neubauer, it's a pleasure again to be before you this evening. I'm in the negative, and Brother Neubauer is in the affirmative. Apparently, he does not understand the nature of debate. When you're in the affirmative, you're supposed to present affirmative arguments. Did you hear an affirmative argument for his proposition? Not really one was presented. He is back on my proposition trying to disprove now after my proposition has already been established. He's trying to go back and undo the damage that's been done. Because I made the point from the very outset that if I prove my proposition, which I did, then I necessarily disprove his proposition. And by the way, I did not write your proposition. You wrote it. That was a false accus accusation. Brother Neubauer, you did. I did not write your proposition. You wrote it. And that is a false charge. I stated that the proposition needed to be on the resurrection. That's where we were involved in the, in the discussion. I did not demand that you sign a negative to affirm. In fact... You were offered, I understand, I believe, the opportunity to even correct that. That you could have given a positive affirmation. But you chose, you chose, Brother Neubauer, to affirm a negative proposition. Furthermore, you whined considerably about a point of order that was immediately corrected. So... You wasted your own time there. I do want to apologize to you for one thing. I claimed, I said several times, that uh, you are the one who uh, invented this phrase, protracted or projected, projected eminence. I believe in giving credit to whom credit is due. Really, it was Don Preston in 2006, your mentor, who created that phrase. And I even have an article that uh, sets it out. Notice what it says. Notice the statement uh, that he makes here. He is looking at uh, Deuteronomy 4. Notice that in the context, God emphatically said... After you have been in the land a long time, when you sin, you will soon perish. This is a prime example of projected eminence. Now watch this, and I emphasize it, as I call it. He invented it. You know, what's fascinating is they will take passages and argue that projected eminence is based on the idea of context to take a uh, situation that is spoken of as being at hand and put it thousands of years in the future, that they can do that, or hundreds of years in the future. But when we use and make the argument that given the context, both immediate as well as remote, you know there is such a thing as remote context too, not just immediate. There are many things. How do you know that water... For example, is involved in Acts 2 verse 38. You have to not just base it on that particular text. You have other passages you go to to establish the element. Particularly Matthew 28, 8, 18 through 20, which you say has already been fulfilled and completed. But we point out that immediate and remote context indicate that an at-hand statement is given from the perspective of deity rather than humanity. And, oh, you can't do that. He's up in arms. What he, what he uh, says he can do, we can't do. He makes a rule, or Don Preston does. He may, uh, they make a rule and try to apply it. Personal reflections on an adversary should in no instance be indulged. Number four. Number five, no one has the right to accuse his adversary of indirect motive. 
He said, Holger's uh, mentor is Don Preston, and that should in no wise be reflected. That's indulging upon uh, a, an indirect motive that should not be accused here. Let's keep, let's keep the propositions at hand, and let's keep those kind of personal attacks out of this debate if we can, please. That's fine. Would it be okay. Is he his mentor? I'm sorry? Is he his mentor? Absolutely not. I mean, we, we didn't get up here and say that Alexander Campbell was your mentor, or, 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 or we did not go to there and we weren't going to. We don't want that in this debate. Let's keep this on proposition on target, please. Well, fine. As uh, far as I'm sorry, we apologize. Thank you. Time. Time. Yeah. Don Preston went on to state in other articles that hyperfederalism is in its, quote, is in its discovery stage meaning it's not come to any absolute consideration. But hyperpreterism, therefore, is not static and thus violates the nature of truth, which is static. It's fascinating that uh, Brother Neubauer has stated that Romans 1.16 is obligatory or was obligatory but temporary. That's basically what he said. Now, the basis of Romans 1, 16 is verse 17. Look at it. After he said that I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. And in Romans, the idea is the means by which God makes man righteous. Is that still binding today? If so, verse 16 is still true. He is misusing the phrase to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That simply acknowledges the format that was followed from Acts 1 verse 8. The gospel went first to the Jew and then ultimately to the Gentile. That's all it's saying. It's not saying you've got to go to the synagogue first to preach the gospel and then go to Gentiles. That wasn't the idea at all. And that's a misuse of that statement by the Apostle Paul. Do you believe, Brother Neubauer, you, you need to answer this when you get up here. Do you believe that verse 17 is still true? Is the righteousness of God the means by which man is made righteous revealed in the gospel of Christ? If not, then no one can be saved today. And if it is, then Romans 1.16 is still true because verse 17 is its foundational point. That's a simple fact. Now, he uh, said he wanted me to answer a particular question uh, concerning, uh, actually brought up Daniel 8.26 and then he ran to Daniel uh, 12 and then to Revelation. I want you to open your Bibles to Daniel chapter 8. You want to talk about context. Let's back up a little bit in the context of verse 26. Go up to verse 20. Daniel has had a vision of a ram. And then he says, The ram which thou sawest, this is what the angel tells him, having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. It's the Medes and the Persians. Now look at verse 21. And the rough goat, and there was a rough goat in the vision, that ran upon the ram and destroyed it. The rough goat is the king of Greece, Gratia. That's Alexander the Great. Now you were talking about time references. Was Alexander the Great alive in A.D. 70, brethren? Was he alive in A.D. 70? Was his kingdom around? Or was the kingdom that he established still around? Now watch. Now, he says, the great horn that is between his eyes, the first king. Now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. And in the latter time of their kingdom... That's the latter time 
When the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding, dark sentences shall stand up. That was a man named Antiochus Epiphanes in the second century B.C., over 200 years before the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, verse 25, And through his policy also he shall uh, cause craft to prosper in his hand. He shall magnify himself in his heart. And goes on. The vision centers on this prince. That's the background. It's not dealing with the destruction of Jerusalem. It's dealing with the intertestament period. Now come to Daniel chapter 12. And notice two problems he has. Two huge problems. By the way, last night when he went to Daniel 12, he conveniently jumped over verse 2. But Daniel chapter 12, or accidentally, don't want to accuse him of doing that deliberately. Daniel 12 verse 1. And at that time. Keep in mind, folks, Chapter divisions are there by the translators, not part of the original text. At that time reflects back to chapter 11. Well, what is chapter 11 dealing with? If you will read chapter 11 very carefully, it deals with the kings of the north and the south concerning the kingdoms of Greece, the Grecian people. You see, when Alexander the Great died, his kingdom was broken into four parts two of which were the, the uh, Ptolemies in Egypt and the Seleucidae in Syria. Maybe uh, we need a class on Greek history, ancient history, and on the background of these texts. A text taken out of context is a pretext. Daniel chapter 11 gives a very striking picture of the conflict between the king of the north and the king of the south during that intertestament period. And so it is at that time that Michael, who sta shall stand up, the great prince who stands for the children of thy people. At that time, this is the historical connection of Daniel chapter 12. And I want to ask Brother Newbar as well, since he likes to ask questions, I'll ask him this. Is Daniel 12 totally, solely concerned about the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70? Is that what it's concerned about? Is that its total uh, contemplation? For a second thing, notice. Michael, the archangel here, stands for thy people. Talking about the Jews. Michael is fighting on behalf of the Jews. What he needs is Michael destroying the Jews. He needs Michael attacking the Jews. In this passage, Michael is pictured as being the defender of the Jews. And he was against Antiochus Epiphanes. We need to get the facts straight. There's also another problem. You know, the siege of Jerusalem the actual siege, the war began around 66 A.D. The siege of Jerusalem itself didn't start until February of 70. It ended either late August, depending on which chronology you follow, or early, spring, uh, early September, mid-September, uh, 70 A.D. According to historians and according to for example, Philip Schaff is one who cites this. The daily sacrifice that was not uh, ended until July of 70. There's not 1,290 days between the taking away of the daily sacrifice and the uh, destruction of the temple. You don't have that time. You know that from July to September, if you give it the farthest date in September, you do not have 1,290 days. Period. It's not there. It is historically false. His interpretation is false. The Hebrew word that is used here is tami. That was the daily regular sacrifice. It ended in July. 
as Philip Schaff demonstrates and states. But, guess what? Amazingly, the sacrifice that uh, at the time of Antiochus Epiphanes, who also desolated the temple and desecrated it, that at that time, the sacrifice was ended 1290 days before, before its cleansing. What an amazing fact that we have. Antiochus Epiphanes is the one who fulfilled the last part of Daniel chapter 12, not, not uh, General Titus of the Roman army. Keep in mind, the Jews again were destroyed. They were defeated in A.D. 70. But the vision of Daniel 12 is ultimately a vision of, of victory, not of defeat. And we need to be aware of that. That's a vast difference. It's a vision of victory for the Jewish people because it dealt with the intertestament period, not, and not, ladies and gentlemen, the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. Now we come to Second Thessalonians. He brings that up. And he asserts, and again, it's simply an assertion that because the mystery of iniquity was already at work, therefore the uh, individual who uh, is the man of sin, or is supposed to be the man of sin, has already been revealed. The text doesn't say that, doesn't imply that, doesn't demand that. He said the man of sin was a high priest. Well, do you know the high priest, the rightful high priest, had actually been removed in 66 A.D.? That's four full years before the destruction of Jerusalem. He wasn't there when the city was destroyed. In fact, the original high priest, if I remember, the rightful one that was recognized at that time was actually murdered by the Zealots. Furthermore, furthermore, the uh, uh, miraculous power was never claimed by the high priest. He never claimed miraculous power, and yet that is what 2 Thessalonians 2 uh, ascribes to the man of sin. Well, that doesn't fit. Then, the temple is a problem for him. He said, it's, he said uh, the high priest was, he implied he was in the church. Now, he may, meant, may have meant that it's the high priest in the physical, literal temple. But that's a problem if he does. Because he has said this is apocalyptic language. If he says that this is the physical material temple of, of Jerusalem and everything else is, <laughs> is figurative, why is it literal? The text says that the man of sin sitteth in the temple of God showing that he is God. Well, is he literally God? Or is he a phony? I suspect that what we have here and what I submit is a figurative use of the phrase, the temple of God. Just as the phrase, showing himself as God, is also figurative in a certain sense. He is not, he is not the real God, and he is uh, one who would uh, lead a false religion. Is it the Pope? Could be. Could be any number of people. The Bible simply has not revealed that. Why? Because the man of sin has not been revealed. He has made an assertion that he has, and uh, the text just doesn't support it. All the text asserts in verse, uh, back in verse, uh, verses uh, 3 through 6 is that there must be the revealing of the man of sin before the second coming takes place. That's all. That's all we have. And he is trying to read far more in there. And all these other passages he's tried to tie in, 1 Kings 10, 14, Isaiah 66, 15 through 18, all by assertion. I believe every one of those passages. But they do not apply in the way that he tried to apply them. Let him make an argument on them. 
A real, genuine argument. This man studied under Thomas B. Warren and Roy C. Deaver, two of the most logical uh, men in the brotherhood, best logically trained. And he knows or should know how to make a formal, proper argument. He hasn't done that. He didn't do it in, try, in trying to attack uh, my own proposition for the first two nights. Keep in mind again, he was supposed to be in the negative those nights. He tried to take over the affirmative. Now that he's in the affirmative, he wants to be in the negative. He's topsy-turvy on this. Turn completely around. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, the Bible teaches, and this is on the proposition of the resurrection. The Bible teaches that when Christ comes again, every eye shall see Him. 